The particular nugget about social marketing that I want to talk to you about today is segmenting your audience. And in my experience, this is the hardest conversation that a team of program planners can have. You know, we come into these uh, jobs as experts in our field, and we are all passionate about what we do and what we know. And we assume that if other people knew as much as we did, they would be passionate too. And so we also have a tendency to want to change the world, and that means everyone in it. So the idea of separating and categorizing groups of people can be just abhorrent to some people. As a matter of fact, I was working with a, a program planning team one time, and when I asked uh, the group to list out the audiences that they potentially wanted to reach, and then I said, now select the one that you want to, want to address this project to. A woman, she, she recoiled, her hands came back, she pushed herself away from the table and she said, I want nothing to do with a program that would cut out any of these groups of people. They are absolutely all essential. But you know, she was missing a criti critical aspect of the marketing process, which is if you try to reach all of those groups with the same methods, the same strategies, and the same messages, you really risk not reaching any of them at all. And so I'm going to give you my top three reasons for segmenting your audiences. And <laughs> I like to ask people, when was the last time that you had enough money in your budget to get to everyone. So that brings me <laughs> to reason number three in the top three reasons to segment audiences, and that is budget. We never have enough money to reach all of the people that we're trying to serve. And so segmenting your audience really helps you figure out where to spend your time and money so that you do the most good. So the top second reason to segment audiences is that we are almost never the target. And here I'm quoting Pe Dr. Peggy Hannon from the University of Washington, speaking to a group of her, her graduate students in public health. And she said, if there's one thing I've learned about m social marketing, it's that we are not the target. We are almost never the target. And I'm going to tell you a story about that that I think will help illustrate that point. The other reason, the top number one reason to segment audiences is so that we can be effective. Because we're almost never the target, we would just be guessing about what other people find meaningful and valuable. We would just be guessing about what barriers they're facing to adopting the behavior that we're trying to get across. And you know, we, wouldn't, we would have no idea to help them, how to help them overcome those barriers. So here's a story um, that I hope will illustrate some of these points. Back in the mid-90s, the Surgeon General released a report on the remarkable health benefits of physical activity at the moderate level. So before that, it was all about jogging and, and um, biking and um, being physically fit, lifting weights. Well, they came out with new science saying that many significant health benefits could be accrued at much lower levels than we previously thought. At the time, we were working with a coalition of health and fitness advocates, and we collectively agreed to use the social marketing process to promote the new Surgeon General's guidelines and to try to bring more people into the physical activity fold. That's when the real fun began. We assembled an interdisciplinary team to examine the data and figure out who should be our target. So in other words, we knew just enough about social marketing to be dangerous. So we had a health educator, a marketer, that's me a long time ago, and an exercise <laughs> physiologist. And um, this takes me back to segmentation region number three, and that's budget. We started this project with about $35,000 and a statewide goal. So we knew we were going to have to narrow our focus if we were going to have any chance of making a, de a dent. Um, so we all agreed women should be the target because women were less active than men, and we assumed that women needed different kinds of strategies. 
Um, the two of us on the left, the health educator and the marketer, we actually had a little bit of social marketing training, and so we started thinking about who would be most ready. And we projected that perhaps women at the midlife, somewhere between 40, 55, 60, would be more ready because, let's face it, they had a little more time, maybe their kids were grown, and a little more concerned, a heightened concern about our health going into our golden years. But the woman on the right, our scientist in the group, she could not let go of women in their 20s, 20, 20, 35 age range because they were the mo least active group of the bunch. And she said, they're our greatest need and that's where we need to concentrate our time because these women are laying down habits that are going to affect their health for the rest of their life. These conversations weren't pretty. We locked ourselves in a room, and over a series of three meetings, we gnashed, we argued, we wrote, we covered the walls with flip chart paper until we kind of got things narrowed down a little bit and said, okay, we're gonna let the audience tell us who's most ready to accept our $35,000 worth of marketing. <laughs> so we decided to aim for the group in the middle. Nancy talked about the group in the middle. So not the, the early adopters, they're already exercising, they don't need our help. Not the ones that were couch potatoes because 35,000 probably wasn't gonna go very far with them. So we went for the group in the middle, those that were intermittently active but not yet at the recommended level. We decided to go ahead and include men because we weren't sure if maybe some of the things we offered to women might work for them too. And um, we, we did an age breakdown, so the, the groups that were like 25 to 40, 45, um, then we did groups that were like 45 to 60, and then one of our coalition partners came along and said, you know, I work with older adults, and I, I like what you're doing here, and I'd really like to know if any of this would work with them. So we threw in a couple of groups with people in the 60 to 70 age range. And we separated men and women because we assumed that there would be differences. And here's what we learned. The people on the left, the health educator and the marketer, were wrong about a couple of things. Men were just as interested and inactive as women. And younger folks were just as interested as the older folks. But the person on the right was also wrong on a couple of things. While the younger folks were just as interested, their barriers were much greater than we could address with the program that we were trying to launch. They had kids at home, they had full-time jobs. Their breaks were spent in school conferences and soccer games. They didn't really have time. There were a few things that cut across all groups. So preventing diabetes. There were benefits that appealed to everyone. Improves your mood and sense of well-being. The connection between physical activity and mental health. And the, the aspect that if you do these things, you could feel better and live longer. And some clues began to emerge about who would be our best target, our best segment. And two men in particular, I felt, spoke well for the rest of, of the participants. One of them was a, a pleasantly plump gentleman in a group in Spokane who said, you know, I just celebrated my 50th birthday and I'm staring the rest of my life in the face and I gotta tell you, I'm scared to death. So he, he said those health benefits were very motivating to him. There was another man in a different city, and he was kind of short and, and round, and he reminded me in appearance of uh, Danny DeVito, only maybe a little bit taller. And he said when he introduced himself, I smoke, I drink, and I eat red meat. I figure I'm gonna die anyway, I might as well die happy. Ha ha ha, that was you know, a fun way to kick off the meeting. So we went through the health benefits, we went through the recommendations, we went through what you would get out of it, and went back around the group at the end and asked each person to say what was most motivating to you. This man, in a much more somber mood, said it's that one up there about live longer independently. You know, I know I said I'm going to die anyway, but what if I don't? What if I end up spending, I don't want to spend the last 10 years of my life in a wheelchair or in a nursing home. So a, a, a segment, a, 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 both an um, attitudinal and an age segment began to emerge because many of the people who said 
that they were most motivated to become more physically active based on what we had to offer this new scientific announcement or information were in the age range of 50 to 70. And about those busy parents in, the 20, in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s, they were equally impressed with the facts, but it wasn't enough. What they needed was more time and perhaps childcare, and that was beyond what our project had to offer. So our target began to define itself. It wasn't strictly about age. We found motivated people across all those groups, and it wasn't about gender at all. So that was a surprise to us. But where we found the greatest number was in that 50 to 70 age range, and some of what we had to offer would cut across groups. It would spread out in communities. Which brings me to reason number two for segmenting audiences. We are almost never the target. And if <laughs> that team of experts, and you may have already put this together, we're people too. We argued in those meetings from our own walk of life. So there's Dorothy on the left. Her kids are adults and starting to have kids of their own. There's me. My kids are in high school. I had a little time to myself. I didn't have to constantly monitor them. I was speaking for myself. And Charlotte, the one with more kids, more tied down, younger kids, was arguing for herself. That's another reason why we have to go out and talk to people, because we bring our own walk of life into this um, conversation. So we launched our campaign aimed at 50 to 70 year olds. We partnered with members of our coalitions who had programs on the ground, opportunities on the ground, so that what we were pushing, there was, a, there was something, there was the help me in that community, that when someone decided they were ready to act, there was something there to help them do it. Which brings me back to the top reason, the number one reason for segmenting your audiences, is because it really works. We made a difference over 12 months in two pilot communities. We were able to raise the awareness of ways to be physically active that could really measurably benefit your health. Housework jumped 116%. Yard work jumped 230%. And also the, the mentions of what it will do for you if you're moderately active, people repeated that it'll make me feel better, it'll increase, um, it'll, it'll help me feel better and live longer. Living longer jumped 245%. And significantly, after just a year of this we did attract more funding, but a very low budget social marketing effort. We moved people along on the scale of intention. So it jumped from 54 to 62, 66.2 percent people who said they intended to become more active within the next five days. In conclusion, <laughs> the top three reasons for segmenting. Number three, budget. We don't, we can't afford to reach everyone. Let's figure out where we can do the most good and put our time, our money, and our efforts in that segment. Reason number two, we almost are never the target. And if you don't go out and talk to people, if you just use your scientific data and talk to your team, your target audience starts looking suspiciously like you. And the top reason for segmenting your audience it really works. Thank you. Oh.